إلى الله جميعا أيها المؤمنون لعلكم تفلحون. We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by bearing witness that none has the right to be worshipped or unconditionally obeyed except for him. And we ask Allah to send his peace and blessings upon his final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his family, his companions, and those that follow until the Day of Judgment. And we ask Allah to make us amongst them. Allahumma ameen. Dear brothers and sisters, the entire khutbah is going to revolve around one particular story, but a story from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu in Sahih Muslim that requires quite a bit of build-up. Because it starts from us adjusting our own lens before being able to really perceive what the Prophet Sallallahu lived through and to be able to properly contextualize the difficulties, the hardships, and the day-to-day -day of the Prophet Sallallahu with those things often being intertwined. The daily life of the Prophet Sallallahu was laced with hardships, some of them unimaginable tragedies, some of them the daily struggles of one who lived in poverty, and one who lived without asking anything from anybody around him. So before we can even get to this particular incident of the Prophet Sallallahu I want us to just start off with adjusting how we view the ayah that came down to the Prophet Sallallahu that shook the companions. The ayah was, ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ عَنَ النَّعِيمِ It's a very simple ayah. It comes in Surah Takathur. We read it very frequently. That you will be asked about your blessings on that day. Allah will ask you about your ni'mah on that day. If you search that ayah within the books of ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, you find no less than 30 incidents in which the Prophet, peace be upon him, reminded his companions at a time where they might have otherwise belittled a blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to them of the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One, one, one incident which is not the incident where the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr anhu had not had anything to drink for a long time. And then after a long hot day and struggling, someone finally offered them a sip of cold water. And the Prophet ﷺ, just as Abu Bakr anhu took that first refreshing sip of cold water, said, لَتُسْأَلُنَّ عَنْهَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ You're going to be asked about that sip of water on the Day of Judgment. Because otherwise, it's just a sip of water. When you live in the desert, when you live in heat, and in our situation, even when you're not living in that heat, you're constantly sipping upon water. You don't think about, how am I going to get clean water? How am I going to access clean water? But how many people die in, this, in, in our current time because they don't have access to clean water? So the Prophet I'm reminding him that you're going to be asked about that sip of water. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a very similar incident. Umar radiallahu anhu actually answered back the Prophet sallallahu He held the water in his hand. And he said, An hadha ya Rasulullah? About this? This is what we get asked about on the Day of Judgment? And the Prophet sallallahu said, You will be asked about every single one of your ni'am, every single one of the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you on the Day of Judgment. Now, in a world of convenience... Or I shouldn't say in a world of convenience, but in, in the lives of convenience that we live, because the world is not what we live. In our constant state of consumption, in our seemingly unlimited access to things that we can consume, we often lose sight of these things. In the blessing, subhanAllah, as you sat here, as you walked into this masjid, and you sat down, how many people actually took the moment and said, Alhamdulillah for central heating. Most of the world doesn't have this blessing. And for most people, when they can light up a fire in whatever it is that they have or, or turn on that, that space heater, even if it's, you know, if it's as manual as they come, when it finally heats up and they finally start feeling the comfort to where they can start to remove some of those layers, they go, Alhamdulillah. They recognize the blessing of that heat. You don't recognize it because it's too easily accessible. You don't even have to flip a switch. You have it automatically timed in your home, maybe. You don't even have to think about it. It just happens. And you forget that it's happening because of how easy it happens. A lot of times when you don't have to struggle in the process of attaining something, that in and of itself 
is the reason why you lose appreciation for it. You forgot what it's like to have to struggle for it and strive for it, but subhanAllah, it's so easily accessible to you. So that might be why you lose appreciation for a blessing. But Allah will ask you about this. Just as Allah would ask you about a sip of cold water on the Day of Judgment, Allah will ask you about your air conditioning. Because that provides the same, the same effect of, of coolness on a hot day. Allah will ask you about it. It's a ni'mah. It's a luxury. It's a blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you that many people don't have access to. You don't think about what it's like to access water because you have access to clean water. You don't think about these things. And when I say you, I mean me. Those of us who live in this ni'mah, this perpetual state of blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. And surely we have different degrees. But here's what the Prophet sallallahu said. Everyone in here, everyone has their different degrees of life standard. And some people live in homes that are bigger than others. Some people live in apartments. Some people have nicer cars. Some people have more money in their bank account. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said alayhi salatu wasalam, man asbaha minkum aminan fi sirbi. Whoever amongst you wakes up safe in his home. The greatest blessing is safety. If you own the biggest mansion with all of the luxuries in Damascus right now, you wouldn't feel safe. And that mansion would do nothing to insulate you from the sound of the missiles and the airstrikes on the outside of that home. It would mean nothing. You wouldn't take comfort in your tub. You wouldn't take comfort in, your, in the food that's being served to you that night because at the end of the day, you're hearing those bombs falling and you know that it's only a matter of time before they end up in your neighborhood as well. The ni'mah of being able to wake up not in a war zone. <laughs> SubhanAllah, who thinks about that? Not worrying about it. You wake up, alhamdulillah. We got to worry about home burglars. Okay, you're not in a war zone. من أصبح منكم آمناً في سربي. A person who wakes up safe in his home. The feeling of safety. Not having to worry about that insecurity. The Prophet وسلم, he said after that, مُعَافًا في جسدي. Safe or, or, or spared in regards to his health. We might have health issues here and there, but overall, the ni'mah, the blessing of afia, the blessing of just having... Uh, you know, the, the capacity to be able to function in a normal way without being held back because of your health. Whereas once something starts to go wrong, another thing starts to go wrong, you have this uncertainty, which is at the root of it all, the uncertainty, as well as, you know, the regular hospital visits or whatever it may be. Mu'afan fi jasadi. And then finally, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, عِنْدَهُ قُوتُ yawmi." And he has enough to suffice him for the day. He has his food for the day. Quta is usually in association with food. He's got his food for the day. The Prophet ﷺ said, فَكَأَنَّمَا حِيزَتْ لَهُ الدُّنْيَا It's as if he has conquered the entire world. You live like a king. Relatively speaking, you live like a king. And you should be saying, Alhamdulillah, for that. That you live like a person who has conquered the entire world. What if I don't have all of these things? Well... That's your, that's your portion. And you should still thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what you have. But if you have these things, which would represent the generality of what we have here, it's as if you, you own the world. You possess the entire world. And the Prophet is saying, if you have that perspective, then you're grateful. ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَئِذٍ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ the beginning of that surah is al hakum wa takathur You've been destroyed by your pursuit of quantity. The reason why you can't be grateful for the small blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you, small in quotation marks, is because you're too busy trying to pursue more, more, more. In the pursuit of quantity, you've lost sight of the quality of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already given to you. You can't, you can't develop that type of perspective because it's already there for you. It's already there for you. So when you think, that you will be asked about your blessings, you might be thinking about your home. You might be thinking about your car. You might be thinking about the, the, the nice clothes that you have. Whatever it is that you're thinking about, 
falls in the category of embellishment, not in the category of ni'mah, of the, of the bare blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already given to you that you might not thank him for. And that's why the majority of the mufassireen, if you look at Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, as suddi all the way down, when they mentioned this ayah, what is na'im and this ayah, they said, as-sihhatu wal-amn. Your health and your safety. Your health and your safety. If you've got your health and you've got your safety, you own the world. You possess this entire dunya. You have everything that you could possibly want. When the Prophet ﷺ said, two ni'mas, two blessings that often go unappreciated, underestimated in our lives, unused, as-sihatu wal faragh your health and your free time. Think about the ni'mah, the blessing of your siha, the blessing of your health. What would a person pay to get their health back? Think about where you are right now with your health. What would you pay to get back to the state that you're in right now if you found out that you were going to lose it all? If you were diagnosed with something that, that would cause you to lose this health and you have to go through this treatment and that treatment and you're going to lose the ability to, to do this or the ability to do that you would empty out your bank account just to get back to a semblance of what you have right now. The ability to sit and stand and walk. SubhanAllah, a person suffers a physical injury and they're unable to walk for, let's say, you know, three months. The way you feel once you're able to somewhat walk again, it feels like you're a king. Why does it take the break for you to be able to appreciate that, for me to be able to appreciate that? Once a person starts to lose a siha, nothing else matters at that point. Everything else gets put on pause. Work gets put on pause. The pursuit of dunya gets put on pause. Your goals are put on pause. It's all on pause because you want to regain your health. You just want your siha back. And the irony of this hadith is that many people have time uh, because they don't have health. A siha to al faragh the reason why they have faragh, time, is because they don't have health. And when, you're un, when you don't have health and when you're going through some sort of medical tragedy or crisis, then suddenly you have a lot of time on your hands. And at the same time, many people who have health don't have time because they use their health in constant pursuit of dunya, so they don't have time to make use of that, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them as an ability to draw close to Him. So these two things, when they're combined in a person, are often going to be unused, unappreciated, and a person will develop a general attitude of ingratitude, an inability to understand what they truly have. The cold right now, if you just drove just a few miles out, you will find people that will not be able to sleep. SubhanAllah, there is a church, and I'll actually, Oakland United Methodist Church in downtown Dallas opened up. They did a pop up shelter where they let the homeless come and sleep inside their church for a night. And I was talking to the pastor there, and she was saying, when people left the next morning, it looked like they were walking out of paradise. One night to sleep in central heating. You have that. What does that mean in regards to our responsibility to other people? There are people that are freezing to death in Dallas. And there are people that are freezing to death in the Muslim world and all over because they don't have access to the basic things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. When I was in the refugee camps, I just needed to make wudu. And subhanAllah, I was just looking at these, at these people and going to the bathroom is a mission. I would have never thought means the bathroom. Having a bathroom. You don't say alhamdulillah for the bathroom. You don't say alhamdulillah for the ability to use it, for the comfort of being able to use a restroom. Going to the bathroom is a mission. It requires all sorts of hurdles to be able to use the restroom. And then to do wudu, the water is unusable. You have to sit there and heat it up and then you know, make sure that it cools down to an acceptable temperature so that you don't burn yourself. The process of being able to make wudu was a 45-minute process. I thought to myself, subhanAllah, these people in order to worship Allah have to go through these hurdles. But don't you think they appreciate it a little bit more than we do? 
once you finally get that cool water and you start pouring that cool water, subhanAllah, and you start thinking about that hadith as you're making wudu in the freezing cold and that water starts to warm you a little bit, and you say, Alhamdulillah, this water feels incredible. Alhamdulillah. You start to think about these things a little bit more. Now, as I said, I wanted this all to build up to one hadith of the Prophet wasallam that honestly causes a lot of problems. Causes a lot of problems, and I'll tell you why. The hadith is in Sahih Muslim. It's narrated by Abu Huraira anhu, who has his own famous story of hunger, where the Prophet وسلم, recognizes hunger. Abu Huraira was homeless for some time, and he used to go hungry many, many days and nights, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him eventually to where he had a home and, and, and had those uh, basic things. But listen to this hadith. It's narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he went out of his home at an odd time of the day, at an odd time of the day or the night. So it was a time that the Prophet ﷺ typically would not come out of his home. So it can be assumed that it was between Dhuhr or Asr or it was sometime in the night the Prophet ﷺ came out. When he walked out, he noticed two people sitting in the masjid, Abu Bakr and Umar. May Allah be pleased with them. Typically, this story would end up going in this direction. They then went and they worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they proceeded to some sort of expedition or some sort of uh, place in Medina or to visit somebody because that's how it always was, right? The Prophet وسلم, Abu Bakr and Umar. How many ahadith start off that way? The Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr and Umar, may Allah be pleased with them both. This one is different. The Prophet وسلم, comes out of his home at an odd time of the night, and he notices Abu Bakr and Umar sitting there. And he says to them, مَا أَخْرَجَكُمَا مِنْ بُيُوتِكُمَا هَذِهِ السَّاعَةِ What is it that brought you out of your homes in this odd hour? And you know what they said? They said, الجور يا رسول الله Starvation, O Messenger of Allah. We're hungry. We came out out of hunger. Abu Bakr and Umar, these are the three most important people in the ummah. Think about that. And they're sitting in the masjid, and they said, the only thing that brought us out at this hour was al-jur. We're starving. We're hungry. And guess what the Prophet ﷺ says? وَأَنَا وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِي He said, and I too, by the one in whose hand is my soul, لَأَخْرَجَنِي الَّذِي أَخْرَجَكُمَا I only was brought out of my home because of that which brought you out of your home. The Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr and Umar were hungry and they were coming out of their home at an odd time of the night because they were hungry if you just stop and pause at that for a moment the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who had the most adoring set of followers of any man in history who had the greatest generation present with him in the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Khayru ummati qarni, the greatest ummah, the greatest generation of people, the greatest man with the two greatest men of the ummah that were not prophets. In the masjid, in a prominent place, because they didn't have anything to eat and they could not sleep because of their intense hunger, the man who alayhi salatu wasallam used to have people at his door all throughout the day and night, knocking and calling out to him, always making demands of him, about whom Allah revealed Surah Al-Hujurat. People calling upon the Prophet ﷺ, the Surah of the Hujurat, because they were calling upon the Prophet ﷺ throughout the day, throughout the night, night and really harassing him. He was being harassed alayhi salatu wasalam. To listen to this person and listen to that person and do this and do that and not being given his privacy, not being given his personal space alayhi salatu wasalam. And they were hungry. No one noticed that the Prophet sallallahu Abu Bakr and Umar were hungry. And this is a reality, by the way, that we have to understand that usually caretakers are never cared for. It's a part of our human psyche. No one thought to ask the Prophet ﷺ if he was hungry. No one thought to ask Abu Bakr or Umar if they were okay. The Prophet 
who used to go out and would, if he noticed hunger in your face, think of the narrator of the hadith, Abu Huraira, who once, the Prophet ﷺ just knew he was hungry by looking at him and took his hand and found him something to eat for the night. He knew it from your face. The Prophet ﷺ, who spent day and night in the service of the people, feeding the people, no one bothered to ask, Ya Rasulullah, are you hungry? Kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an. His khuluq, his character was the Qur'an. تحسبهم أغنياء <laughs> You would think that these people are sufficed because of their ta'affuf, because of his modesty sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It never showed. He was smiling. He looked fine. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never showed discontent with his companions. He never showed them that he was hungry. He never showed them that he was in need. In fact, the only time he did it sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was when Umar radiallahu anhu, one of the three hungry men at that time, walked up to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the battle of Ahzab in al-Khandaq and pulled up his shirt and showed the Prophet ﷺ that he had a stone tied to his stomach because of how hungry he was. And the Prophet ﷺ pulled up his shirt and he had two stones tied to his. That's the only time he ever disclosed his situation, alayhi salatu wassalam. Kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an, he was a walking Qur'an. You know what? This is the implementation of la nuridu minkum jaza'an wa la shukura. We feed you for the sake of Allah. We don't want anything from you. No thanks, no gratitude, no compensation. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who went out, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Umar, who were competing in serving the people in the obscure parts of Medina, were hungry. It's not an excuse for the ummah. That doesn't mean the community got a free pass. Like, oh, okay, well, it's their fault. No, it's not their fault. People need to pay more attention. The volunteers, the caretakers, those who, who, who lead in whatever capacity, they also need to be cared for because if they're cared for, they can care for better. But out of their akhlaq, it didn't show. So these three men, subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Bakr and Umar, all gathered together hungry. And so he is living his own example, alayhi salatu wasalam, and that's the peak of service and not having any expectation of the people. Far from living like a king, the Prophet ﷺ was living poorer than everyone else that he was serving. And he'd never complain to the people. The story continues. The Prophet ﷺ said to them, Qumu, get up and let's go find some food. The Prophet ﷺ, the greatest creation, the greatest human being ever alive, and Abu Bakr and Umar, the greatest two men of this ummah, walking around hoping that someone will find them and give them food. They come to the house of one Ansari man, and the Ansar were a generous group of people, and the woman of the house was there, and you imagine opening your door at this strange time of the night, and who's at your door? The Prophet ﷺ, Abu Bakr and Umar. Something must really be wrong. This is probably a death announcement. I mean, how does, how does this happen where these three people show up at my house in the middle of the night? So she said, marhaban wa ahlan. Like she was shocked. She welcomed them. Marhaban wa ahlan. Greetings to these amazing people. And the Prophet ﷺ greeted her back. And they asked her where her husband was. She said that he went out to fetch some water. <laughs> so he's a simple man. He's going out to fetch some fresh water for them to be able to drink for that night. But she invited them in to wait for the husband. The husband comes back home with these canister, with this water, and he sees these three men sitting in his living room. And he said, Alhamdulillah, all praises be to Allah who honored me with the most amazing guests. What privilege do I have to have these types of guests in my home? And so as he started to, to, as he started to see them sitting there, he recognized their need. He gave them water, and then he went out and he started to collect dates, a tamar, all sorts of dates, ripe dates, dry dates. He starts bringing the dates, and he starts hurrying up back to the Prophet ﷺ and to Abu Bakr and Umar, serving them dates with their water. And then, not only that, after he got them those dates, he takes his slaughtering knife, and he goes and he grabs a sheep, and he wants to slaughter and cook uh, for them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, make sure it's not halub, make sure it's not a milk-bearing sheep. And he knew his sheep, that he, he, he had his, his, his flock. So he slaughtered, he cooked, and then he served them that cooked meat. The 
Prophet Abu Bakr and Umar sitting in your living room eating water, dates, and some meat probably for the first time in months. And at that moment, as they're eating to their fill, the Prophet ﷺ, who does he look at? He looks at Abu Bakr and Umar. <laughs> you don't get off because of this. He said, وَالَّذِي nafsi biyadi." He said, look, we lived this experience together. We lived this, that's an unforgettable night. That's an experience that you don't forget. And these are companions. These are three men that deeply love each other. And he says, وَالَّذِي nafsi biyadi." I swear by him in whose hand is my soul, You will be asked about this night, about this blessing, on the day of judgment. What got you out of your homes was hunger. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ثم لم ترجعوا حتى أصابكم هذا النعيم But you are not returning to your homes without having been touched by the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you better be grateful for these blessings. SubhanAllah, it's unfathomable to think of the Prophet sallallahu as the hungry prophet. You think of the brave prophet, you think of the courageous prophet, you think of the eloquent prophet, you think of this, but the hungry prophet alayhi salatu was salam, the orphan prophet alayhi salatu was salam, the grieving widower alayhi salatu was salam, the grieving parent alayhi salatu was salam, and here the hungry prophet, the hungry Abu Bakr, the hungry Umar, who in their lowest moments, this is an experience, this isn't, the Prophet sallallahu would go hungry often, in their lowest moments are still being reminded to say alhamdulillah, because you will be asked about that blessing on the day of judgment. Now, to summarize, an attitude of gratitude here from the shama'il of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And my time has run very short. From the shama'il of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi from his description, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was already expressing gratitude before that moment. He was expressing gratitude by not complaining of his situation, and by still being a grateful servant to Allah subhanahu wa taala, even as that situation was taking place. So it's not until he, it's not when he praised Allah after. It was his attitude before he got that naim as well. From the attitude of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from the shama'al of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as Aisha radiallahu anha says, he never found fault in anything that was given to him and he never criticized any food that was served to him. He never. Can you, any king, prime minister, leader, how would they act with their food? What about us? What about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He never once criticized the food that was given to him. Not once. He never criticized a gift that was given to him. Anything that was given to him, the Prophet ﷺ showed gratitude. If he didn't like the food, he simply didn't eat it. But he would not, he wouldn't look down upon it or talk down the gift or whatever was served to him because that would be in gratitude, not just to the person who gave that, that, that gift or served that food, but to the one who provided that in the first place. Alhamdulillah. He didn't, he wasn't inclined. There wasn't a slip up. The Prophet ﷺ never showed ingratitude for anything that was given to him or criticized it, whether he was in Mecca or whether he was in Medina. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says that three hilals, three crescent moons, meaning three months, would pass upon us, and the only meal we had in our homes were al aswadan, the two black things, al ma wa tamar, water and dates. That's all we would have. If you had water and dates in the place of a meal, and someone asked you, did you have dinner? Would you say, yeah, I had dinner, alhamdulillah, I had dates and water. You wouldn't even say that. You wouldn't even call that a meal. That was the food of the Prophet ﷺ many times. Those were his meals. How do we get down to this? There's a practice. Allah challenges you and I. وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا If you were to count the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you would not be able to do so. If you took one blessing Allah gave you and tried to count the blessings within that blessing, you would fail, I would fail to be able to, to fully count those blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, always find something good to say about your situation. People are complaining, find something good about the situation. If people are talking down something, talk, talk it up. Always. Speak of the blessing of your Lord. Show that gratitude. 
Make sure that it's vocal, vocalized. Make sure that you're saying Alhamdulillah for what it is that's been provided to you. Try to pay attention to the things that others are not paying attention to. You know, you read all these websites on how to show gratitude. The first thing they say is a gratitude journal. Write it down. Allah already said it. Count your blessings. Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah uh, would make it a point to actually sit there and count the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What can I be grateful for that I wasn't paying attention to today? Something that came very simple to me. Count those blessings. Say alhamdulillah for them. Always say something good about the situation that you are in. Find something to say good about that situation, even if everyone or everything around you is pointing towards the bad of that situation. And the last thing, don't you ever feel entitled. Don't you ever feel entitled. We are not better than those people that are dying in the cold right now. We don't deserve it more than them. Our ahwal are a test for us. Our state is a test for us and their state is a test for them. But no one deserved the blessings of this world like the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr and Umar. May Allah be pleased with them. But they didn't feel entitled. It wasn't an entitlement. It wasn't the Prophet ﷺ saying, it's about time you recognized my hunger and that you did a better job. They were not entitled. Instead, they were always grateful. We should be questioning ourselves as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose us for the comfort that we are in right now. And the best way to thank Allah for a ni'mah is to use that ni'mah in a way that's pleasing to Him. And you don't fully appreciate that ni'mah until you're in contact with people who don't have that same ni'mah as you. That's why you visit the sick. You recognize the blessing of a sihah then. That's why you visit the graves. You recognize the blessing of life then. That's why you accompany the orphan. You recognize the blessing of what's been given to you. Those who are freezing, those who are hungry, that's when you really fully appreciate it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use us in the service of people. Make us amongst those who are grateful in our words, in our hearts, in our actions. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those that will be raised amongst the shakirin on the day of judgment. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah ilakum wa risa'ala muslimin fa astaghfiru inna wa ghafur rahim. Allahu, Allahu, Allahu